We're going under the hood with Dr. Sunshine, where we explore topics that are relevant to STEM professionals with intersecting identities. Thank you for listening. Welcome back everyone to episode four of Under the Hood. This is a brand new space once again for aspiring current or retired STEM students and professionals. This is also a space where the friends and family of those people can hear firsthand accounts about the behind the scenes of these experiences um, as we've decided to dedicate our lives to STEM and our experiences can be quite nuanced. And with that, I will introduce our illustrious podcast guest for this episode, Dean Sharon L. Walker. If I had sound effects, I'd have the clap. <laughs> Guys, I'm so excited and honored to be able to share space with Dean Walker, or I'm going to call her Sharon throughout the, the, the recording, and I'll tell you a little bit about her background. Uh, Sharon is the Dean of Drexel's College of Engineering, and she is also a distinguished professor in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering. She also holds an appointment in Chemical and Biological Engineering, and she's a distinguished professor in the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science in the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> She is a Yale-trained water quality systems expert focusing on the fate and transport of bacteria and nanoparticles in water. And she is also a fellow in the Amer Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors, AWSP, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. And so with that, Welcome, Dean Walker. Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much, Sunny. I'm just, just so thrilled to be here with you today. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have this conversation. I'm thrilled to bring our mentor menteeship to the forefront. And for those of you that may not know, I attribute my introduction or start in academia to, to Sharon. Um, she wrote a bold proposal to fund uh, the faculty positions for myself and two other colleagues because she saw a vision for <laughs> supporting diverse faculty member at, at UC Riverside. Um, and with that, I'm hoping to bring some of that context into the conversation and we'll go ahead and get started with our question. So the first part of the podcast, we'll talk about uh, Sharon's career path, with, which I think is really interesting and I've heard bits and pieces. And so the first question is, when did you decide to pursue your career in environmental engineering? Well, Sunny, thank you for the introduction. That's really the fact you give me credit for helping you get started in your career is just really incredibly touching. And we look for, I look forward to talking more about that with this group later as in our conversation. But my own entry into engineering was unexpected. I, um, I was actually not interested in engineering at the start, partially because nobody told me about engineering. I was a young woman who was very good and across all the disciplines and nobody seemed to think, oh, hey, she's great in math and science, we should tell her about engineering. In fact, I was training in music. I started playing guitar and piano when I was four years old and I was trained as a classical guitarist and I thought that that would be my future. But I was also kind of sporty and so while playing ultimate frisbee on the playground, somebody knocked the uh, disc out of my hand and with it tore all the ligaments in my finger. And it was a pretty serious injury that meant months and months of physical therapy to return to the strength in my finger. And so during that time when I couldn't play my guitar, my teacher moved away and I was moping around sort of feeling sorry for myself as teenagers often do. My mother found out about a program. Gosh knows how she learned about it, but it was a program to introduce women and people from historically underrepresented groups to engineering. 
and it was at New Mexico Tech in Socorro, New Mexico. And these wonderful faculty had put together a program to introduce us to engineering. And it was like a summer camp. My mom sent me there and it was just so eye-opening. Nobody had ever explained what engineering was and the way engineers can address world problems and make the world a better place. And so this program, it was so eye-opening. And Bill Chavez was my professor there. I still am in touch with him. All, the, I, all these years later, I check in with him every few years and uh, he's now retired. And, but he, he played such a major role in my life introduced me to engineering. And it was actually while we were on a field trip in that program, uh, going to a, a wastewater treatment plant, not the most glamorous field trip, but I remember walking over the catwalk over uh, the secondary clarifiers, learning about biological treatment that I thought, oh my God, this is cool. Like imagine how you can use natural processes to address pollution. Uh, that's, that's when I decided environmental engineering was for me. And I came home from that summer program committed to, to studying environmental engineering. I changed my major from music to engineering and, and never looked back. But I will say here, it is because of that experience that I am such an uh, advocate of programs that introduce young people to engineering. Because we can't assume people will hear about it from their teachers, from their college counselors, from their families. We have to intentionally introduce young people to this career uh, track. And we particularly have to make the time to introduce those who are historically underrepresented. You're here. I completely agree. And I have heard this story before about the wastewater treatment plant. And my first thought was, you were thinking about studying it stinks there. <laughs> Funny, it didn't even phase me. It never phased <laughs> me, but. Yeah, so for those of you that haven't been to a wastewater treatment plant, um, it's intense. So it's I, a very important part of, of creating an important you know, infrastructure to support healthy living. You've got to appreciate it. And it's, it's actually a, puts to you some really cool fundamentals of science. Absolutely. Hopefully, when we get back to in person instruction, we can take them on a field trip to show to start to show with the field trips. And so with uh, the next question I want to ask is, you know, you decided to go into environment or study more about the science and engineering behind these types of things. How did you decide that you go to Yale for grad school and how did you pick your undergraduate institution as well? So I have to admit I'm from an academic family. So I have that privilege, absolutely. I'm a third generation academic. And, and there's a lot in the literature that shows those who come from academic families tend to go on in academia and, and be successful because we know what the business is and what the expectations. No one in my family had ever been in STEM before. So for that, it's very different to be an academic in STEM than it is an academic, say, in political science um, or geography, which are what the others in my family studied. But I knew about academic life. I grew up on the campus at USC where my father spent his entire career in the administration. And so um, I was very fortunate that I had a tuition benefit from my dad's years of service at USC. And so when I considered where to go to college and I considered what the options would be, my parents were very open telling me to go where I felt I would fit best. But I'm very grateful to my 18 year old self who realized the value of not going into debt and to take advantage of that tuition benefit. So I went to USC with no regrets. My education there was phenomenal. Um, and I loved my student experience there, no, no question. I can't help it, it's sort of, you, you get indoctrinated quickly. It was a great place to study. Uh, but then when it came time to graduate school, and interest, I have an interesting story here. I, I had an advisor that uh, his approach to mentoring was to basically make you feel like you couldn't do it, to inspire you to work harder so you could do something, which is not my style. I quite don't like, I mean, I really don't like that. Now I make a point of saying, you are talented, you can do that. I don't say somebody, well, you probably aren't good enough just to make them work harder. Like that just is undermining. So I had basically been told you probably won't be able to get into graduate school. And so I had actually applied for a job and um, had had a job lined up at a, um, I don't wanna give the name of the company, but it was a wallboard making factory. 
I was going to be the environmental engineer on site, making sure we met all the remediation obligations before any kind of uh, effluent from the plant would, would leave, right? Not very glamorous, important, but not glamorous. But I, I had that job lined up because I was so fearful that I wouldn't get into graduate school. But fortunately, some other faculty stepped forward to tell me they thought I would make good you know, graduate uh, school material. And my parents were very supportive. So I applied broadly. And you know, I really love the fact that that same faculty member who told me I probably wouldn't get in, I got in everywhere and I took him those letters back in the day when it, before it was email and it was envelopes. I took the pile of envelopes of acceptances and showed it to him. That was one of those sweet told you so moments in my life. So I was really grateful that those other mentors stepped forward to tell me I have what it takes because I was not hearing that from the person I was looking to for guidance. Uh, how I chose the program is an interesting one. The one thing that I learned very quickly is that I am not a techie engineer. I mean, I've never been the type to build my own computer. I've never, I think robotics is cool, but I've never felt the urge to build one. I've never been the one who knows the latest and greatest of whatever technology. I still use, you know, my grad students or my children teach me how to use my cell phone. I mean, I'm not a techie engineer by nature. I'm an engineer by thinking, by problem solving. Uh, and by approach, but um, not in a techie sense. And that mattered for where I chose graduate school because my interests are broad and varied. And so um, not being disrespectful to any of the other places I was accepted, but um, this is why I chose Yale. And Yale was just starting a brand new environmental engineering program. They had a chemical engineering department and they had a very and still have a wonderful forestry and environmental studies school, which now they call the School for the Environment. Uh, and they were basically merging those two, pro, uh, two wonderful programs, taking chemical engineering with the environmental science uh, from that professional school, merging those course offerings and creating an environmental engineering degree. I was part of the first recruited class to that new graduate program. I was the first woman in the program. And it was started by a really exceptional man named Manny Elamelech, who had actually been recruited from UCLA to start the program at Yale. Uh, and so when I went to visit, I could just see this was a different place. They were trying to create something truly interdisciplinary, just by the nature of how they were putting the program together. And they were doing it at a university that really values interdisciplinarity and, and the breadth of scholarship. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think, have been happy at a school that was primarily a tech institution like MIT, where I was considered and did visit. Uh, it's a great place, but it just wasn't a vibe that I knew would match me. So I went to Yale, and I have no regrets because as as long as uh, along with my research, I was also able to, you know, make friends with sculptors and lawyers and you know, pe right, you know, people who are going through medical school or composers. I mean, it, everybody from the arts to STEM, it was magical. Uh, so I have no regrets, and I think that the mentoring I had there had a huge impact on my career, still does. My mentor still sees himself as my advisor. <laughs> He'll still send me notes when he thinks I need to be doing something. He, uh, he's just been a wonderful mentor and career long mentor. Um, and I think that had a huge amount to do with where I am today was because I had somebody who took great um, ownership of my training and of my well being and, and launching of my career. So that was a long-winded answer, sorry, about how I ended up there, but it was a very holistic choice about where I thought I could be happy and, and meet the needs of all my interests and, and made sure I fit. There are a lot of good nuggets there. Um, I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, were you named as a distinguished alumni from your program just recently? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, I was really flattered. Uh, Yale did a... Um, a year of the woman type programming where they were celebrating um, the, the, the years of women on their campus. Um, it's still quite recent that women were allowed uh, to join the undergraduate class. I think it was 1969, women joined the undergraduate class there. They've been doing graduate studies there much longer. Um, and so they did a wonderful series of programs celebrating women. And then they had an edition of their alumni magazine that celebrated uh, 15 notable women out of the alumni classes from Yale and I was the one profiled for women in engineering. That was, 
I must say, I, I got the chills when I looked at that because I saw myself on the same pages as women who have gone on to national prominence as, you know, it, it was, I'll just say that it was humbling and uh, maybe my imposter syndrome came out a bit when I saw that, uh, that, <laughs> that issue. Yeah, so uh, to the, to the, to my uh, women STEM up and coming early career folks, as you can see, you know, we are always underselling ourselves. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but this mm -hmm. is a this is a constant um, thing that we deal with. And in, in yeah, it doesn't it doesn't go away. You get better at managing it, uh, perhaps a little bit more accepting of the accolades, but it doesn't mean it comes naturally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say that Dean Walks, Sharon, you know, she has helped me quite a bit in that area. So just to get uh, uh, back on perhaps talking about your thought processes for graduate research and things like that. So how did you choose your PhD advisor and your dissertation topic? Good question. So the program was new and small when I got to Yale, uh, but very flexible. They allowed me to consider projects with a variety of different faculty. And I originally thought I might want to work with two faculty, many being one of them and one other person. And so for the first year or so, I was trying to work with two, two advisors. And it, I quickly learned sometimes it's just hard to please two. Uh, they have different expectations, different mentoring styles, different expectations for pace of progress, and it just was too hard to please both. Uh, and so I spent a little time thinking about who might be the better mentor for me in the long run. And so many was just sort of the clear, clear fit for me, um, particularly because his style was very involved. You know, when you choose an advisor, sometimes uh, you'll get an advisor who will give you advice, but then you're really expected to go off and sort of do your own thing, come back to ask for help. It's kind of the hands-off version. I don't do well with that. I've always done better with a hands-on mentor, somebody who stayed with me, checked in with me. Uh, I felt that they were watching and, and helping along the way, and that's that was many style. Like he would, we would meet weekly. You'd expect a weekly update um, when. I gave him a draft of a paper. I would have it back the next morning on my desk. You think, oh, now I have a few days to rest. Well, I, you know, well, he has the paper. Mm -mm, he got right on it. So that kind of quick feedback loop, uh, the regular engagement and input was very important for me. I still like working with people that stay in touch as a more uh, more than those who might be detached. Uh, I do better with that active engagement. That's just the way I learn and and function best. So it was, it was a good choice for me. I'll acknowledge there's some students who do better with the hands-off approach. They really want to be challenged to figure things out for themselves, feel more of a sense of ownership of the progress. And that's okay too. So I think every student has to choose their advisor based upon how they best work, how they best are motivated and respond to feedback. Um, so I don't think there's one way better than the other, but this was just the way that I, I work best. As, as to how I chose my PhD work, I had come in from uh, my undergraduate studies. I did two majors, two bachelor's degrees, one in environmental engineering and the other in environmental science with a biology emphasis. And I've always been fascinated with natural processes, right, from the wastewater treatment plant and continuing on. Um, and at the time in the in the uh, 90s, we were looking at bioremediation where we were using bacterial uh, remediation of different subsurface contaminants. And one of the big challenges at the time was how do you get those bacteria, whether they're engineered or naturally evolved populations, how do you get them down to the contaminant? Because what would happen is you'd inject them and then they would all just sort of stay right near the, uh, the injection site and, and kind of clog up the, the sediment. And so I was really interested in what could we do to maximize bacterial transport to contaminant zones. So this idea of bacterial transport in the subsurface really interested me. And this is something that many was famous for was studying colloids, in this case, inert particles in, in porous media, 
So I was the first student to sort of bring the biological side in and we looked at applying those fundamental concepts and uh, experimental approaches to bacteria. So it was a learning experience for both of us because it was the first time he ever had to deal with colloids that actually had some personality <laughs> and <laughs> would act independently. Um, so there, there was definitely growth for both of us there, but that's how my project came about. It was, it was really informed by what the challenges of industry were at the time and my in interest in, in trying to utilize natural processes to address these, these, these issues. That's incredible, guys. What you just heard is Sharon brought her own interest to a lab with the fundamental expertise that would help propel or push that interest forward. And that's, that's really unique. <laughs> And I don't know how much that happens today. Um, usually the way that the funding is set up, you recruit a student and they just do the project that you're funded to do. But mm -hmm. um, I would love to have more of this organic, the student brings their interests. Um, and then you mold your the student's interests with your deliverables to make something yeah. more magical. Right. Well, I will clarify, I did do the work my advisor had for a project, right? There were deliverables he had on a federal project, um, but he was very thoughtful about not making that like really rigid boundary conditions. We met the project and we took it all sorts of new interesting dimensions to it. So I, I helped him on both a USDA and an NSF funded project in my five years with him. Uh, so we met the deliverables, but those were just launching places. There was still a lot of freedom allowed uh, to, to extend beyond just what we said we might do in a grant. And I think that's there for a student. You know, a student might be hired on a project, but a student should take the time to think about what questions could be asked beyond the scope of that project and propose it, suggest it to the advisor, because not only is that going to be interesting, but it could lead to future funding, it could lead to additional publications and just sort of new avenues of inquiry that could be just fun. So I think a student who's coming through the ranks shouldn't be afraid to propose a, a new direction that, that um, nucleates out of a, an existing project. Yeah, I'll also admit, I do have students that do that as well. I don't wanna take credit away from them. Yeah, thank you. So that was your graduate research, which obviously propelled you to a fabulous academic career. And so, you're obviously in academia. How did you know that academia was the route for you? Again, this is where I had the privilege of coming from an academic family. You know, my, my grandfather and my uncle who were tenure track faculty all their careers spoke with such satisfaction over their work. Uh, the kind of, particularly my uncle who, was, who spent his career at Berkeley in geography he was always and is still doing scholarly work even though retired because there's this passion um, for for the work and joy of working with students and so i don't think i ever this sounds sad i don't think i ever considered anything else uh if i now i do want to say that i didn't always have the confidence i'd make it i knew i wanted to try it so i think you'd be amused to know i had a backup plan so remember, I had to back up plan at a wallboard factory if I didn't get into graduate school. Well, if I didn't get tenure, I thought maybe I'd open up a piano bar because <laughs> I love I love music. I love jazzy music. I play the piano. Not that I would ever have been the performer because I'm not that good. But, um, you know, in England, the nickname for Sharon is often Shaz or Shazza. And I thought Shazza's sounded like a really great name for a jazz bar, don't you think? So I figured if, uh, if tenure didn't work out, that was my backup plan. I had this great group of friends that were working towards tenure at the same time I was. We all arrived at UC Riverside about the same time. And we would just get together over dinner and say, hey, what are you going to do if you don't get tenure? And we just had so much fun sort of talking about it. And it, it sort of normalized the fact that we were all still a little nervous, even though we were all you know, high performers, it sort of normalized the nervousness. Um, I don't think I ever went so far as to identify where I'd open the place up or what the, you know, the menu would be or any of the business model. So 
but it was there. It was there that I was always worried a little bit. Um, I have no regrets, however, because uh, being in higher ed is, it's a calling and a joy. Like every year there are fresh faces that arrive on campus ready to change the world. I mean, what a gift to be exposed to those young people um, and be able to be able to educate them, give them opportunity, help elevate them, uh, you know, and their, their, their mindset. Um, and when I mean elevate, I don't mean to suggest they're not coming from, they're not coming from a lowly place, but help sort of elevate their consciousness and awareness of their field and their place in the world. Um, I love that. I love working with college age kids. Um, I've always enjoyed my research. So that continues to be a, a source of satisfaction. So, you know, once I was in it and I knew I could get tenure that I, I've never been able to fathom doing anything but. Wow, wow, wow. I personally was happy to hear you talk about your dinners. Um, I do something, a different version of that, but I think it's it's nice to hear that you know, you think about, or you've thought about, or many other women have thought about, you know, what if, and that that is a natural thing to think about. So look at where she is, everyone. Well, and, and honestly, that doesn't go away. And I think that's a healthy thing to do. I mean, I worry a little bit now that I'm in administration. What if, what if I have a new provost that doesn't like what I'm doing or university president changes and they don't like how I do things, you know? And the joy is I do have tenure. And so I can always return to purely faculty roles, which would be fine. But there is there are other what ifs, you know. Uh, I do have some thoughts about how else I might proceed if, if my administrative career were to end for reasons beyond my control. Um, I think that's a healthy thing. I, you know, you don't want to go too far in depth. But just, just to know that life is going to throw you curveballs and don't be totally surprised if someone comes your way, having some sort of thought process on, on what other things will make you happy and fulfill you, I think is important, just so that you're prepared for all the unknowns. And if anything we've learned in the last year and a half is that the, the possibilities you never thought would come can come, right? It's that's being an engineer. We're trained to think about contingencies. That's so I would right? say, yeah, it's true. It is our training. It, it really is. Alternative A, B, and the do nothing option. <laughs> so with that, um, I think this is a great segue into the what ifs, uh, from the what ifs to um, more anecdotal experiences. And so, so can you please share with us um, your experiences and challenges when you were uh, transitioning from graduate student to faculty? And for those of you that don't know, um, Sharon was recruited straight out of graduate school. Um, so can you explain to us what was going on during that period and yeah, absolutely. So I realized my path is not necessarily as feasible now where I took a position straight out of graduate school without a postdoc. I actually had a postdoc lined up, but then UCR offered me the job and I, so I skipped the postdoc and came straight. Um, actually, I should say, you see, I had a postdoc in, in Europe. It was through a, um, a Marie Curie fellowship lined up. It was to go to Germany for two years, which would have been a fun adventure. But then Riverside offered me a position and they said, you can come now or you can come after a postdoc for one year. So I lined up a postdoc at Caltech, but then the funding fell through. So I ended up coming straight without a postdoc at all. And that was a tough time because, um, well, one, confidence. And two, when, you, when you're right out of your PhD, the only, P, you know, the only projects you know are your own and those of your friends who are in the lab with you. And so probably the biggest challenge I had is understanding what's the scope of a project. What, what are typical expectations? And this really was a challenge when it came to writing grants because my first few grants I wrote were either too narrow or too wide. You know, it's sort of like the uh, Goldilocks, right? Too, you know, too soft, too hard, or just right. And I, um, 
I threw a lot of darts at the NSF, so to speak, till, till I started to hit. Now, fortunately, I had the wonderful guidance of Mitch, who you all met in the previous episode, when I was assistant professor. And one of the things that was so wonderful is that if, if you could get your grant written in time, which I quickly learned to be prompt and ahead of schedule, he would write it, read it and give edits and give input. Uh, and I think that mentorship I had and how to in my grantmanship was was huge. That was a struggle. Now I'm not entirely sure had I postdoc would I have learned that because not every postdoc mentor guides a young scholar at how to write a good proposal and scope. Uh, but that was something that I had to learn and, and good help and guidance um, came along. That really also gets to the issue of mentoring students. You know what? How do you set expectations for students? Because they're not you. Not every student is going to be as is like you and how they work and how they operate or how driven or motivated they are. So at the start, learning how to manage students, it was the first time I really supervised. I mean, I'd supervised undergraduates in the lab in grad school, but that's not the same thing. When you're trying to mentor a student from the time they enter to, through their PhD, is it's a journey. And learning how to mentor them well and being responsive to their needs and proactive when they have needs. Um, I wouldn't say that was difficult, but it took attention. And at the very beginning, that 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 consumed a lot of my attention as I took on my first few students. And so that probably took more time than it might have otherwise. Um, I think some of the challenges I also had, so those were more internal challenges, how I managed launching my research program. I think another piece was the teaching. I had been a TA, but I'd never taught a full class. Uh, and I was coming from semester systems only, right? USC and Yale were both semesters. And then in the UC system and, and Drexel now too, they're quarters, 10 weeks, they're fast. How do you cover content that fast? How do you cover in a way that the students can learn, that, that they can get feedback? So you have to have enough deliverables and enough either quizzes or such that you can get graded and back so the students can really also can understand how they're doing along the way. That was hard. I was really lucky. I had a marvelous teaching mentor in Mark Matsumoto, who was a faculty member at UCR, associate dean, and now dean at Merced. Um, so he was wonderful. He shared his lecture notes with me, even on classes I wasn't teaching, because I just would look and see how he crafted a class and how he put things together. And he gave me some good rules of thumb on how long a test will take you versus what it'll take a student. So I think he usually said, go ahead and take your sample test or quiz and multiply it times three, and that's what a typical student will need. I think it's more like times four. <laughs> but uh, that's how I would judge the length of my, my exams. Uh, things like that I hadn't been taught in graduate school, so I'm very grateful I had mentoring there. The other thing that I have to do is shout out to my Association for Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. They have a commit an education committee where you can reach out and, and talk to others and people will share content for classes. And so I reached out and said, oh, I have to teach this interesting topic. Has anybody done that? And you know, then I'd be put in touch with others who were teaching similar things. And we'd talk about which, you know, which textbook to use or what field trips might work or what other modules to add in the class. So, and at their meeting every other year, there would be conversations on this. So I felt like I had a community of people outside Riverside where I could go and ask for help. Many professional societies have some subcommittees or discussions. ASEE, American Society of Engineering and Education, talks a lot about this. But I don't think new faculty realize those resources are there. And so I encourage you to look, anybody who's listening who's uh, at this stage in your career, look at your professional societies for guidance, for help. Um, and, and don't be afraid to ask peers at your institution or elsewhere for lecture notes, for a syllabi. People share. I, I really, you know, and if someone's not willing to share, keep asking because there, there are other good souls that will help you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. When you're brand new faculty, it's okay to ask for help. Thank you. And the common theme of what everything you just said is you reached out to a mentor. There were people along the way to help you through each of these milestones. That's key. And you mentioned ASEE. I'm going to give a shout out to uh, a professor in my cohort, Mona, Dr. Mona Eskandari. She has harnessed um, the materials and the training 
along those lines to improve engineering education. And she's published in this area and she is a decorated uh, lecturer at UCR. So I know it works, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll say it's a special skill and uh, I really uh, look up to people that are able to use these resources. Yeah. It was and, really helpful. It was incredibly helpful. I'll add one other piece about my transition to a new faculty that I think is important, especially considering who, who our audience is today. When I arrived, I was the only woman in the department on the faculty. And it was like that for four or five years, maybe. I'm trying to remember exactly when Akuya Sawuku arrived. But it was a few years while I was the only one. And I was the youngest by far. I was 28 years old, straight out of graduate school. Um, and my, my peers were older, mostly married, mostly with children. Just different life stage. And so I didn't really fit on a lot of fronts. I didn't have colleagues asking me to come home and have dinner, right? These guys were not inviting this young single woman to their homes, right? So it was very isolating. I don't think they meant to be unwelcoming, but I just think our lifestyles and life stages were just so different. So I had to work really hard to make relationships with my colleagues. Uh, there was a group that would eat lunch every day out on some picnic tables out, outside the building. And it was kind of awkward because they talked about things I couldn't relate to if they weren't talking about work. But I forced myself, I would take my lunch and I would make sure I would go at least once or twice a week to eat with them. Because at those discussions, they, you know, in between chatting about who's doing what with their kids and how things are going, they might say, hey, I heard there's a new call from the University of California or there's a new call from NSF. And some very useful mentoring and discussions were happening. And when I wasn't there, I missed it. And when I was there, I was able to benefit. So. I made sure I didn't miss that because a lot of informal mentoring happens at those meals over those coffees. And even if you feel it's a little awkward, you kind of have to go still. And over time, I went enough that I learned like, oh, so-and-so's, you know, leading the kid scout troop, right? And, and then you could start asking questions and, and start developing rapport. And over time, I think they all became very good, good colleagues um, and some friends and good friends and so it just it I had to force myself past that activation energy barrier to to get there and and find enough time together where we could develop a critical mass of things in common but it's awkward at first right I mean I felt really different man that that that's really uh, comforting to hear and the activation energy is real mm -hmm. getting over that nervous barrier of meeting someone new someone that's probably more accomplished and you really don't know if you have anything in common, but um, once you cross that barrier, you're, you're absolutely right. I still do that. You know, it's interesting. I still go to conferences and we'll have this moment of, again, that imposter syndrome shows up again. And I will always force, my, and I'm an extrovert. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert with a capital E and underlined and in bold and italics, right? But I go to a conference where I may not know people or there's some like really distinguished mucky mucks there that I'm kind of intimidated by. I will force myself. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to go to this opening reception and I'm going to force myself to stay for half an hour. Once I get there, I'm fine. And I'm usually like somebody who closes down the party because I just, I'm so social. But I'll tell you, there is a conscious act of forcing myself to get ready, do a little breathing, getting myself in a mindset and, and then going. So doesn't go away again, but um, I, I force myself to overcome it each time. And I'm always glad I do because there are wonderful people out there to be met and to work with. Great A, <laughs> great A advice. Uh, well, okay, and, and with, with that being said, uh, I, I'd really like to understand now how you're bringing in all these mentorship skills that you've, or all these skills that you've acquired through mentorship, how do you then chart the progression of your research career? And how did that come about? Like, how did your lab today come about? So a huge amount of the trajectory is a function of the students I've had along the way. You know, you have a talented student that takes a project even farther than you thought might be possible. So some of the areas we've gone in 
have been because of students' passion and talents. Actually, a lot of the credit goes to them. But at the beginning, when I was sort of the lead navigator, over time, students were more active in helping me with direction. Uh, I came out of graduate school really wanting to focus on bacterial pathogens. And I was very fortunate that in the early 2000s, uh, after some outbreaks, not that this was fortunate, there had been some major outbreaks of uh, food, food safety concerns with like E. coli on spinach and so on in Salinas and a few other places. People really were worried about pathogen presence uh, and thinking that water were, was the uh, transmission mechanism. So the Department of Agriculture was funding a lot in pathogens. And so I was able to, to get some very solid funding for them for a number of years. I had a wonderful program officer who was also, talk about mentoring. She really cared about the research, um, but she also was there to be supportive of me. So also not being afraid to get to know my program officer was, was something that um, I would give that advice to others. So I had a very good run of funding from the USDA. I also learned that a creative thing, which is if you can fund, you can fund your research by doing good outreach and good deeds. So I was able to get a Department of Agriculture grant and an NSC grant that was uh, to bring undergraduates, um, no, let me back up, to bring community college kids into my lab, into labs of others in the College of Engineering. I believe that we're losing a lot of really talented young people uh, that don't get the mentoring they need to transfer from community colleges into four-year institutions to get their degrees in STEM. And to help motivate young people to understand uh, the value of that four-year degree and the excitement of research, we created these programs uh, to bring students into my lab. And I got this great funding from USDA and NSF. However, I wrote into the grant that to do this, you still need a PhD student to supervise them in the lab. So with those, I was able to support two of my PhD students early on. So I was able to meet both directives. You know, when people say, oh, you can't do outreach, it takes away from research, you can't, you know, that's not true. I was able to use, I was able to move both agendas forward and uh, support some of my best early PhD students on those outreach grants. And they were happy to oversee it and they were happy to mentor the students. I mean, that was the ethos in the lab. When I took a students, I was very clear. I expect hard work and good research, but I also, and I expect collaborative work in the lab and sharing of maintenance of the lab and uh, of the lab capacity. And I also expect a certain amount of outreach and supervision of students, of, of younger people. Otherwise, you couldn't be in my lab. I was very upfront about it. So I think there were even a few students who chose not to work with me because they thought, oh, I'm going to be doing all this good deed stuff. <laughs> I just want to do my research and get out. Um, and so uh, we had a real culture in the lab group of commitment to bringing in students. I had, um, I've lost count now how many were community college, but at least a few dozen community college young people came through my lab or through UCR through those programs. And over the years, I had just over 80 undergraduates in my lab before I left Riverside in the 14 years I was there. So that's a big part. Anyway, I, I kind of digress a little bit, but I would just wanted to emphasize to you all that if you're passionate about these things, you can do both. I think a lot of people say, oh, don't get too involved in the outreach and that engagement. Like if that's your passion and that's your purpose, and that was a big part of my purpose, I was able to do both and use one to, to elevate the other. But then the, um, you, oh, go ahead. Y'all, this is really innovative. This is, in, this is innovation. This is bringing together disparate ideas and making it work. And she took a chance and she was bold and she went against the, the popular advice. That takes vision, guts, and I'll, I'll, I need to give a shout out to you and Dr. Heather Smith. Yes. That, that model that you just talked about, the USDA model, mm -hmm. I've used it. And it works. And we did it for air pollution exposure. So, and you've published papers from that project, <laughs> we right? Have a publication. And so, yeah. the, the vision that you had has longevity. Yeah. It has reach. But, and what came from that, and I'm so glad you mentioned Heather, is that uh, finding a partner. Uh, is really important uh, because if you're going to do that kind of, I'm getting off track a little bit, but if you're going to do engagement, you have to have a partner in situ, somebody that's real so that that connection is authentic. You can't just like come from on high and say, now I want to work with you at institution X. You have to have a partner in, in the trenches there. Uh, she did a wonderful job mentoring those community college students, identifying them, helping them on their way. 
we had a hundred percent success rate in the kids we got involved with going on to four-year institutions. And in fact, just two months ago, my last PhD student from Riverside graduated. He was from Riverside Community College. He was part of one of those grants where we brought him in. He did research in my lab years ago. Then we helped to mentor him through the transition to a four-year institution. He went to University of Mexico, and then he came back to UCR for a PhD. So, you know, we saw that full life cycle from a community college kid to now being Dr. White, right? From that that kind of mentoring program. So it it's it's um, it can be done, but you really need authentic connectivity uh, because that's really what makes these programs last for years um, and make sure they're they're meeting the needs of the students. But I'll get back to sort of the research agenda. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't remember if it was a change in secretary of the Department of Agriculture or just political winds that changed, but they really stopped paying attention to bacterial pathogens. You kind of have to have a major outbreak every few years to get that back on the agenda. Not that I'm wishing for that, but uh, so all of a sudden the, the funding was, was gone. That wasn't a priority. Um, and there was this sort of new uh, national nanotechnology in, um, um, NNI, National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, that was putting, you know, millions of dollars into research for nanomaterials. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is brand new. I should probably try something. And so um, I dabbled a little in a project with a colleague and we got some interesting data. What I showed was that my methods that we had developed for bacteria we could fluorescently label nanomaterials and use the same microscopic and transport study approaches to look at faded nanomaterials. And so when it came time to write my third and final attempt at an NSF career award, which had, I had tried in the uh, bacterial side of things and failed twice, in my last year of eligibility, both from my career stage and, my, um, and the fact it was my third try, um, I totally changed and I wrote about nanomaterials, fate of nanomaterials, <laughs> and I got it. So that changed my trajectory because uh, all of a sudden I had money to really develop a new research agenda. And actually what worked is, I well, I should be really clear here. I didn't change my approach. Good fundamental principles and tools can be applied to more problems than you might imagine. I mean, I had to adjust it, right? Nanomaterials and bacteria are different. Impacts by fluorescence, aggregation is different, size is different, you know, temporal sensitivities are different, right? Those, but I could still apply all the principles of fate and transport for to this new problem. So I got that career award and then it got the attention of a few others. I was brought in, asked to be part of a new center proposal uh, that was being led by UCLA and Santa Barbara. On, and it was funded by the NSF and EPA. We had 10 years of funding. And it was called the Center for the Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. And that was an extraordinary time because not only was I a single PI like on a career award, but now I was part of a community. And that was an interdisciplinary project of engineers and chemists and material scientists and sociologists and field ecologists and microbiologists and marine biologists, all of us looking at the implications of nanomaterials, both from how they're made and properties so really looking at it more from an issue of how can you be um, thoughtful about the design so that you can minimize uh, the, the environmental uh, impact or negative impact that was possible when these would get released in the environment. So I was just, I, there was a bit of luck. It was about the timing um, and being invited to be on that grant at the right time. I think they needed a junior faculty and I think they needed a woman. And honestly, I'll take it because it got me in the door. Uh, and there's those moments you're like, is that why I wanna be in the door? But you know what, it got me in the door. And I took that opportunity and really embraced it. And it wasn't just good for me being part of that team. It was phenomenal for my PhD students because it put them in a community of people. So they had the benefits um, so that was a big part of my research. And then there was sort of, I'd say, one other big impactful uh, moment is that people on my campus approached me about putting together an IGER, which was a NSF training grant for interdisciplinary research. They're now under the NRT. Uh, it's, it's like a TI-32 from NIH. It's one of these big interdisciplinary grants focused on PhD student funding, not PI funding. 
and on interdisciplinary training. And we put together one on water and well-being. And my co-PIs, it was so it was me as a I was a brand new associate professor. There was a professor of psychology, a professor of economics, a professor of microbiology, and a professor of entomology. That was my group of co-PIs. And we got it. And we had with with extension six years or seven, I can't remember now, it was many years of funding. And we probably graduated close to 20 PhD students through that funding. And seeing the impact of what happens when you integrate the training and add that interdisciplinarity piece and that team piece was amazing. And my students who participated in that have really gone on to do some wonderful things. We were just starting before we started recording, we we're talking about Holly, right? Who's one of the students supported by that program. And now she's a AAAS fellow. I've actually out of that program had two students of mine go on to the AAAS fellowship and one and um, and the one who went through it already, Drew, he's, he now works in the uh, office of the president somewhere in the big hierarchy of the Biden administration looking at issues of climate change. And so it that changed my research because it brought my students, my students led here where they helped me bring a more interdisciplinary understanding, not just to the project, but to the outcomes and the impact. So much so, they even got me changing the way I give talks. I used to sort of be very linear and my talks would be more like a, a research paper. Here's the problem, here are the methods, here's the results, here's what I think means, and, and, and they're my conclusions. You know, they taught me to start right at the impact. What matters in this work? You, you give your talks this way. You start with the big, I, I noticed that, Sunny. Um, but it was my students who got me there. And so there were these big pieces that helped me along. And I think getting involved in the center and getting involved in the IGERT really changed my trajectory. These are incredible anecdotes. Um, the IGERT, I heard entomology. And so that line of collaboration, that is still going on, right? Yeah, so my my final student finished doing a collaborative project where we were looking at bacterial adhesion in the foregut, foregut of a sharp shooting insect, right? That that's part of disease transmission to plants. But it came down to to uh, so yeah, it wasn't water. It was now an issue of food safety. But the mechanisms are the same. Like, what are the reasons why bacteria stick to surfaces? Under what conditions do they come off? And that helps you project or predict when disease might be transmitted between plants because they're being they're being transported by these insects. It's pretty neat stuff. It, it, it's just incredible because it's 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 much like a butterfly effect. You you make the decision to come together as interdisciplinary researchers, write a training grant, and just the research and training that comes out of that is it's probably it's things that you really can't predict. You can't and predict. Now I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm writing some mental notes. So thank you for that. And shout out to Holly. Shout out to Dan. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with that, I'm, I'm progressing through your career and just learning a little bit more about um, the nuances behind some of your accomplishments. And so uh, we're now in the phase where you're being nationally recognized for your vision and your research. And so in your opinion and your, in your experiences, which of your accomplishments and your qualifications kind of cemented you and your place as a AAAS and an AWS fellow? So what's often not known is that to be a fellow in these societies, you can't just be a scholar. You have to have shown commitment to those societies and years of leadership. So in AAAS, um, interestingly, although I wasn't a leader to uh, the AAAS organization, because I had been a leader in my IGERT that we just spoke about, and that I had sponsored two students and one postdoc to go on to do AAAS fellowships, and also because as interim dean at UC Riverside, um, I worked in partnership with others to create a special program to introduce PhD students in STEM to careers in policy. Um, and, 
and that still exists today. Susan Hackwood really deserves credit. She was the founding dean of engineering at Riverside, who went on to uh, a, really a great career uh, with uh, with managing. Um, well, I'm forgetting my acronyms right now, but working with the state government and providing solid scientific uh, advisement to the state of California's government. Um, and so she saw the importance of how do you take people with STEM knowledge and, and put them in places where they cannot just impact policy and but inform good scientifically driven judgments in government uh, in governance. And so she came back to UCR and with me we created the science to policy program. And so and, and as Dean I supported that and so that is what AAAS was was honoring me with my fellowship a, a sustained career in science and engineering but leadership in creating avenues for young people to take their science to to advising policy and the well-being of our country so that that that's not just an honor you get from um all those papers it's not it was very similar in uh, aesp i had been an officer i was an elected officer i was the chief information officer that helped launch our inaugural uh, relationship with a journal so it was our first official journal with environmental engineering and science um, and at the time we had worked with this uh, organization that helped manage us behind the scenes and then that the person who had done that retired and so i was part of the body that had come up with a whole new sort of administrative model to support the organization and so i i put a lot of work into that group for a few years um, plus i regularly helped organize sessions at conferences and so my fellowship was acknowledging not just again my research and my profile in that way but commitment to the organization and a lot of people don't realize that so you know ieee is a great example that's an organization that not only honors good scholarship but commitment to the organization so for those of you who think gosh am i ever going to be rewarded for organizing this session and that session or being on this panel or or that committee with my society yes that matters from doing that, even as an assistant professor, you're putting together a profile that will make you competitive for a fellowship someday. Now, not organ every organization balances the priorities between the, you know, the service and the scholarship, uh, but they all look at it and they all take it very seriously. I'm just gonna be honest, that takes a lot of energy. And so if you could slip in at some point, how you uh, foster some of that energy <laughs> to get this well, you know, so I, I mentioned I'm an extrovert. That helps. But partially is, 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 you know, although I had good collaborators on my own home campus, the people that I connected with the most in my scholarship were not on my home campus. And so I would want to go to meetings to meet with people. And I early on discovered that you could make a meeting even more effective and better to attend if you or took the time to organize it and invited and made sure the right people came. Right, like if you're going to go to a meeting and you're going to do it, let's invite the people you want to hear from. So I I quickly learned that I would find more fulfillment from a meeting if I just took the time to organize the sessions. And it wasn't a huge lift. Um, and you invite people, and you know people want to be invited. You can't make everybody a keynote, but they sure would like it if you email them and say, "Hey, I'd love you to be part of the session. Take them to dinner, buy them a cocktail afterwards, right?" And then you grow your community. So for me. It was a very intentional way. Of, I got I, it was service, yes, but it was a very intentional way for me to grow my community of of people in my field. Um, and it, it, I was really fortunate. I am really fortunate that my community, in sort of the environmental nano space and the bacterial transport space, are just some super lovely people. And over the years of seeing each other at AICHE or ACS meetings or AESP meetings. They become your friends. We've known each other now for a couple of decades, and um, those relationships make it so that soon your conferences aren't just about going to present and meeting people, but to actually seeing good people. Um, so the service takes that initial, again, we're getting back to activation energy, but then it's steady state. Then you're getting back as much as you put in. Thank you for sharing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, to round out the discussion about your career and the, the best practices and really what made you successful, I kind of want to uh, probe about your administrative career. Mm -hmm. And I'm personally curious about whether or not you took this route because you felt compelled to do so, 
or because of what you saw at yeah. university? Yeah. So I have to be, again, transparent that I came from a family where people had administrative roles. My father spent his entire career as an administrator as opposed to a tenure track faculty. And so I had some comfort with understanding the inner workings of a university from what he had shared with me. So I entered the, uh, the academy not being, the university wasn't a, a black box to me. Didn't mean I understood it entirely because goodness knows UC is distinctive. <laughs> it's got its own ways of operating. But every university has, has some distinction, but, but overall structures in universities are complementary. Uh, so I had some knowledge there. I also knew that both my grandfather and my father finished their careers in administrative roles and had a huge satisfaction with the impact you could make, lasting imp institutional impact beyond your own scholarly work. So I wasn't afraid of administration. And I actually thought it might be a nice goal eventually, but I'll be honest, I never expected to get into it so early. I still, I mean, I'm still much younger than most of my peers, probably all my peers. <laughs> Although with each year that doesn't apply anymore as I'm getting older, but um, uh, so I didn't expect to get into it so early, but I'll tell you how I got into it uh, explicitly was, uh, I didn't have any really compensated or title role in the department I was uh, sort of managing graduate, I guess I was called a grad advisor. I was in charge of master's and PhD student admissions and oversight. So I, I did the admissions and sort of oversight of it, enrolled students. Although I'll tell you, when I left that role, they gave it, they divided it up and made it a job for two people. They each got the same compensation. So I only got half the compensation for doing for, for that really. But I guess I'll take it as a compliment that nobody could sort of do what I was doing single-handedly. But uh, during that time, I think I served in that role for four years. And our graduate program went from being you know, almost entirely international students to about half domestic students. And of that, we were just about 40% underrepresented students. Uh, so, so in this case, I'm being really explicit. We had basically brought in students of color. It was huge success. And actually, that just came from the personal touch. That was, I saw a great applicant. And I remember calling one of them up and saying, hey, you applied for a master's. You have a profile that looks like you could be a PhD student. Wouldn't you be interested? You know, we we'll fund you if you come in for a PhD. And those kind of independent phone calls led to people, especially because they're first gen, hadn't been mentored at their previous institution. I went, okay. <laughs> and so we got a lot of really wonderful students um, coming, coming into our department. That effort got the attention of the grad dean at UCR. And he invited me to be the, as soon as I made full, literally within like a week of getting my promotion to full professor, he gave me a call and asked me to be his associate dean of, of student success. Uh, and and then basically I was in charge of recruiting for the entire university across all disciplines and also student success programming. So I got into this leadership role because I was doing what I thought was the right thing to do, something I was passionate about. Graduate students has always been sort of my soft spot. I, well, students in general, right? But I just, I particularly wanted to make sure our grad students were doing well. And that got the attention and got me a role. I hadn't been tapped for a role in my own college. Uh, I think I might've been eventually, but I think there was some preconceived notion that I was too young, too junior. Um, and so they weren't even thinking about me for leadership, but there I went right in um, and I served there. Um, and then there's sort of, I, there hadn't been an opportunity to lead at the college level for years because the two associate deans had been there for a dozen years or so. And so when Mark Matsumoto left to Merced and it opened up an associate dean role, I jumped at it because I wanted to try to come back and lead in my college. And I'll be really honest, it was an associate dean of undergraduate education, which was not what I had wanted to do originally. I really wanted to stay in grad education and research, but the dean was not offering me that, even though I tried to convince him. Um, but I took the role because I knew that I, I wanted to get back into my engineering roots because as much as I love the graduate school, and this is no disrespect for that role, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as only ever, and this often happens to women, people of color, they get pigeonholed into like grad education or teaching or DEI roles, right? And I wanted to make sure that I could work my way back to lead in engineering. So I took the role and it was when I was an associate dean for undergraduate education that our dean stepped down and actually much to my surprise and I think to a lot of the college I was asked by the provost to be interim dean so I became interim dean when I was 40 and eight months pregnant <laughs> farther ahead than I'd ever planned um, 
it was something I'd hoped to do, but it, but that put me on this trajectory. And uh, I won't sort of belabor the point, but I'll just say that when I got to that role, which is the one I, I had aspired to, but not, I mean, I honestly thought I'd be like 55 plus before I had that kind of role. Um, I realized I loved it. I'd like to think I was pretty good at it. And, and so that's when I pursued longer term permanent dean options. And, and here I am at, at Drexel and I've been here three years. And I'll tell you, I think it's a phenomenal job. I get great satisfaction. It's, it's funny because most people are like, I wouldn't want to be a dean. But the reality is, you remember all those committees you're on and all those reports you write about things we should be doing that are better for students or better for the university or better for research. And, you, and they all kind of go in this black hole and you're wondering like, where do they go? Well, you know what? They end up on my desk. And I'm now in a position where I can to try to elevate them, to support them, make those things happen. And I'm not made of money. I mean, that's the other thing. Everybody seems to think the dean is the one sitting on cash. But, but what I am sitting on is a horizon. I can see what's happening. And, and, and I think where I can be really effective is matchmaking. So sometimes what I give in terms of resources isn't cash, but it's access to people who are doing things that are complementary or facilities. And, and that kind of matchmaking role, elevating people, supporting people, Every day is different, but it's so satisfying. So I can't imagine a better job. This is where our, our, our paths crossed. So mm -hmm. guys, so Sharon, you took a position that wasn't necessarily along the lines of your passions, the um, associate role for undergrad education, mm -hmm. but it positioned you to be in a role that has literally changed my life. Right. So you became interim dean at the at the Barnes College of Engineering. And in that position, you hired me and a couple of my colleagues. And I'm forever grateful for, for you for that, for using that position to just change the course of people's lives. And that visionary uh, action is is life changing. And it's because you were in service in ways that you knew were important, but maybe they weren't, you know, completely self-satisfactory, but you did it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take this point in the podcast to encourage people. You may feel like you're being asked to do something or you're, you're serving in a role and you really don't see the purpose or it doesn't really reflect, you know, your true passions, but it could be positioning you <sighs> to be in a really important role one day and help someone else. And I will acknowledge there's literature to back me on this is that women and people of color don't tend to get into senior leadership roles the traditional way. You can't wait around to be asked to be chair and then to be dean, right? I got my leadership role just like literature says in this sort of um, labyrinth way by being willing to take roles that were not on the, the traditional leadership path, going through the graduate school, going through undergraduate education and going through an interim role. So don't be afraid for the path less traveled. It's, you know, life is not linear. Um, you don't know what'll happen. But I, I wanna add here that when I first met SETI, it was even, I think I was still a professor. I was associate dean at that time. And, and you came to give a seminar in the department. You were like finishing up your PhD. And I remember just because I had come out of straight out of my PhD for a faculty position. So to see you there giving a seminar, I remember projecting my own sort of remembered nervousness <laughs> and, and, and insecurities as I was watching you because you were just straight out of your PhD and you were or still in it and you were presenting the most amazing work but totally underselling yourself. I remember this. I remember the room, I remember where I was sitting and coming up and talking to you afterwards and wanting to be like, stay in touch because I, I, I wasn't sure I could convince people to, I'll be honest, to hire you then, but I knew that you should be. And we stayed in touch. And then when this opportunity for this other hiring initiative happened, I called you and I said, you have to apply for this. This has your name written all over it. Um, but it I just remember how, what an amazing talk you gave that first talk. I don't know if you thought it was, but I sure did. <laughs> I remember I remember the room I remember where you were sitting and I remember seeing you you know fully you know about to have your baby 
Um, <laughs> I thought I was really pregnant. I don't remember yeah. which baby it was, but I was I was pregnant yeah. a lot those days. <laughs> yeah, I re I remember that day. Yeah, um, and yeah, and like she just said, uh, they weren't convinced to hire me that time around, but um, Sharon, they okay. liked you very much. Yeah. I was so green, guys. But you were very green, and that's <laughs> that's often a, not an issue of your ability, but also your preparation for interviews, right? Which we can even on maybe another podcast talk about how to prepare for interviews. Yeah, absolutely. And so, just to be honest, um, I wasn't expecting to get an interview. So, yeah, we do need to talk about <laughs> preparing for interviews. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have another one. I'll be happy to help yeah. with that one. Oh, really? Okay, okay. Maybe we'll have a panel. Um, because I do want to respect uh, Sharon's time. And so um, we'll transition. Thank you for sharing uh, some of those personal details about your career path. Um, I, I, I learned some things that I didn't know. I want to transition to talking about um, something that I have only heard from you explain this way. And it's the work-life equilibrium, and, okay? <laughs> and so, uh, when we first had our first one-on-one uh, -on -one lunch, when we when I moved here, you explained that it's not a work-life balance, but it's a work-life equilibrium. So, can you tell the listeners what you told me? Yeah, I'll uh, try. I think, like anything, there's natural evolution of how one describes this. I once heard somebody speak about work-life balance as a juggle and a struggle, and I just didn't like that. That was too negative. Um, it's not about balance though, because balance presumes that you have balance at all times. And the reality is there are moments you feel imbalanced and, and that's okay. I like to think of it, maybe this is the sort of the chemical engineering training too, because my graduate degree is in chemi, um, is, is that in equilibrium, there are going to be times that, you know, <laughs> You've got more reactants and times you've got more products and the, the reaction is going to go different directions right and then there's that time where then it comes back to equilibrium and i think your goal is to find equilibrium there are going to be times that you're going to be putting a lot more of you into something than you're receiving back um but you have to just find that way in which the receiving back ultimately and over time balances that which you're putting in and it's not always going to be on the temporal scale you might want and you need to manage that um but i think that uh as you get older and it gets a little easier to know what you can say no to and what you can say yes to and what makes you happy and what uh, it gets a little easier to figure out what your priorities are but in some ways it doesn't get easier to do because more people rely on you uh, so it's just it's just a ongoing effort to achieve equilibrium. And I will say that those who are part of your network, your family, your friends, your partner that support you are part of helping you find that equilibrium. And, uh, and just to be kind on yourself when you get a little bit out of equilibrium, it's like anything, maybe you need a catalyst to get, get the reaction back where you need it to be, like a vacation or, or something that allows you some, some balance. I might sign balance, but honestly, there are days that I am not. I want to be very clear. I have four little kids. COVID has been rough. My guest room has been a one-room schoolhouse for the last year. Um, the, life is not always easy, but in partnership with loved ones, you can find that that at equilibrium, and and uh, it's not impossible. It just it just takes um intentionality in making choices and how you're living your life and prioritizing how you use your time and energy yeah thank you for that i think a lot of us need to hear that that it's a constant effort to keep ourselves um at equilibrium and so it wouldn't be under the hood if i didn't ask questions that kind of poke at the nuances of being an academic especially in the 2020s so uh, Dean Walker, Sharon, um, it'll be great to know your opinions and perspectives since you sit on the horizon. And so I have a specific question about uh, millennials, fir first gen students, Zoomers, sorry, Gen Z people. So I just read somewhere that my generation will probably be the first that's gonna be less wealthy than our 
parents' generation. Mm -hmm. And that's due to a whole list of factors. And so for us early career um, and aspiring academics, there's people that want to go into academia, um, but we're facing this kind of uh, economic pressure pressure at this point. Yeah. Can we have it all? Can we be academics? Can we have a family? Can we can we have all of the things we want be fulfilled in our personal life and professional life, um, given this economic precarity? It's a great question. So let's be candid. You're not going to make a massive like salary in higher ed. You are taking a lower uh, pay opportunity to do that than industry. But I think the, the value of it is immeasurable and worth it. So uh, name an industry where you can choose what days of the week you go into work. Well, it's now post COVID, there's gonna be a lot more flexibility, but just cause you're working at home doesn't mean you gotta choose when you work. When you are a faculty member, nobody's breathing over your neck to say you need to be doing this right now you own your calendar and except for when you need to be in class or in office hours or the occasional faculty meeting you own your calendar i didn't miss any pediatric appointments with for my babies uh, as a faculty member i did not say no to any travel opportunities because i owned my calendar um, there was a lot of really wonderful things that i could do that enhanced the quality of my life professionally and personally, because I owned my calendar. That is a that is unbelievably valuable. I also own my own research. Uh, I have friends who've gone and saved pharma and they'll work on a project and all of a sudden, and they're loving their research and all of a sudden the company decides that some you know, member of the marketing team decided it's not gonna be a value added or a sufficient profit margin. So all of a sudden they shut down your years of research to take on a new project because it's no longer considered a profitable out, you know, venture for that company. And you're out of luck you know for us we can study whatever we want now admittedly we may not always be able to get the funding but we have the ability to craft our questions truly on our own curiosity there's again there's not a price you could put on that so what you're doing is you're choosing a level of freedom that i have not yet found another discipline or another industry that gives you that uh, and it's also a huge impact. You think every year there's a new group of students that are graduating that you have impact. I'd like to think I'm changing the world one young person's mindset at a time. I don't think my research is actually going to be doing that as much as impacting young people's lives and their education. But, but that comes with higher ed. So uh, it's true that for many years as a faculty member, I didn't make as much money. I didn't save as much. My retirement wasn't great. Now, being a dean is a little bit better for that, I admit. But there were a lot of years, um, and we were on one income for a while as my husband was managing our little people, for, you know, and, and, and we lived simply. But, you know, I think a part of it is, is that you as an individual or you within a part of a partnership have to prioritize what you want in life. If, if the things that money buys are matter to you, then a tr career trajectory that allows you that house that fancy car, that that kind of vacation, all the kind of um, you know things in life that pop culture might tell you you need or or should want. If that's what you want, then you need to choose a trajectory that allows you to earn that kind of money. But in my case, my I guess I'm a simpler person, right? The what I spoke about that I love about my role, like the the autonomy I've had, the freedom I've had, the impact I've been able to have, and I think continue to have is worth it. And we are saving for four kids in college. So I'll tell you, like, we live a very straightforward, simple life, but I have no regrets. No regrets. Um, and uh, so I just think you need to be really candid with yourself where you're going to be happy. Because I don't want you to resent. I mean, that wonderful freedom of academia does have a cost. It'll be longer to pay off your loans. It'll be longer to buy your first house. It'll take longer to, you know, save up to put your kids through college if you decide to be a parent like i understand it's a it's a tougher ac economic road so it's it's really up to you and your partner to decide whether it's worth it and and i can't preach it to anybody it has to be what matters to you everybody's core value system is different now this 
this is the conversation that I have with so many mentees. And I think I'm just going to start pointing them to this segment of the podcast, because this is the answer. It's about your core values and what you want for your life and whether or not the academic life suits uh, your personal pursuits. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wonderfully said. And so um, the next thing I want to ask you is about tenure and promotion. So this is not really directed to people that haven't um, taken an academic job, but I'm just curious. So in today's climate, is there advice that you would give to an early career scholar in regard to tenure and promotion? Um, that is no longer, or that wouldn't have been applicable of like maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Has the landscape changed for us? Oh, absolutely. It's changing, changed and it's changing fast. In fact, just this past week, I moderated a panel of university president and provosts talking about this. We are all acknowledging that what makes scholarship and what's impactful and what's contributing is evolving. Like how we define it is evolving. And I think that's very exciting. A little bit unnerving because at least whether we liked it or not, the old way you knew what you had to do. You had to get your papers, you had to bring in your money, you had to graduate your students, you had to make sure you didn't screw up in your teaching, at least in an R1, right? That's like what you knew you had to do. It's not that cut and dry. Impact matters. And I think it's partially because we're at this sort of watershed moment where society, or at least American society, is questioning the value of higher ed. Right? We used to be sort of the think tank of the nation. We used to be a resource. We still are, but the, the average American doesn't appreciate that anymore. COVID has been good for re-elevating why higher ed can help, right? We've stepped forward as a community, particularly in medicine and engineering with all sorts of new devices and vaccines and all these things that have helped us show that, that particularly in STEM, we can contribute, but, but all of our disciplines contribute to the well-being of society. Um, and so how do you, higher ed, as we try to, to um, show our value, has to reward that. And the current tenure and promotions process doesn't necessarily reward those things that matter to society, right? And so I think that we're gonna see over the next 10 to 20 years, a huge transformation in how universities promote. I think that where we're, we're looking at impact. So they're gonna be looking at all the people that are healthier because of the research you're doing. All the young people whose brains will be developing better or learning outcomes will be better and ultimate life economic uh, situation will be better because of the research that you have done, Sunny, in, in your, your air pollution work, right? Right now, we don't look at that. We don't pay attention to that. You know, So um, now that's not very helpful for those of you who wanna go through tenure in the next five to 10 years, because I don't think this revolution is gonna fully have run its course by the time you go through a reveal. So if I can be candid, you still need to get the papers, get the money, graduate the students and don't screw up on teaching. But while you do that, don't be afraid to focus on the impact. Don't forget, be afraid to take those projects on that have impact and emphasize that because your provosts are looking for it. Your university presidents are looking for it. The challenge is convincing our senior peers and our department heads and our deans to, to reward it. But I think we're gonna see this shift. I hope that's helpful. That's helpful. I like that you put a number, you're an engineer. You said uh, in the next five years, we may not expect- Yeah, I don't that. wanna give somebody an idea that those yeah. things don't matter if you're finishing up in your PhD or postdoc. I will add, if you don't mind one more thing, that you do have an advantage is that there are parental leaves, there are COVID uh, deferrals, right? That allows you more time and other kinds of leaves that can support you if your life, if you've had to take a major caregiving role or something that's come up that's been disruptive. Use those leaves, use those support mechanisms. That's what they're there for. I think if we all use them and normalize them, we will all have a much more balanced, higher quality of life. I think the challenge is there used to be a culture where people wouldn't use them. And the other thing is don't abuse them. When you're on parental leave, that doesn't mean, especially you dudes out there, it doesn't mean you write all those extra proposals. If you're on parental leave, go home and give your partner a break and feed the baby, right? It's parental leave should not be abused as a way to get ahead but those leaves are meant to support you and use them. Use them for what they're intended, which is to allow you a good life balance 
and slowing down your tenure clock. Thank you for saying that. A lot of my questions usually don't come from the perspective of having a family. So I'm glad that you said that. And I'm, I'm gonna try to get more people on here to talk from that perspective. So thank you. Um, I realize that doesn't apply to everyone, but but there you may be surprised, you know, some, something could happen. You all of a sudden have a caregiving responsibility for a loved one, right? And there are leaves, there's ways you can ask for extensions for that. And so whether you're caring for a, a parent, a child or another loved one, that's what those leaves are for. You don't have to be a parent to, to be eligible for these kind of things. So I just had a follow up about that. There is this notion that there is a career penalty when we take all the leaves, uh, where the maybe the the person that delivers the child would advance maybe through their uh, ranks slower than someone that doesn't. So. What are your thoughts on that? Um, this is an off the cuff question. No, this is a reality. I mean, there are some places that I wish were more, um, more proactive and to support people who took these alternative routes, uh, but you should still take it. And if you were at an institution that's not gonna be supportive, that's important that you know. I just wanna mention, you are not trapped. When you get a job somewhere, you are not trapped. If you find you're at an institution that is not supporting you, you don't have to stay. So if you're at a place that is not turned out to be family friendly or work, you know, in life integration friendly, keep up your excellent profile and go on the market. I mean, we really should be, we're not, we're not putting enough pressures on the universities to actually use these policies properly. And um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't wanna lose any of my faculty, but if I'm not supporting you, then shame on me. And it takes somebody leaving to make sure people are paying attention. So I'm not saying go jump around, but to put pressure on your institution and know that you're not trapped, that you have options. Wonderful. And so while I have you here, Sharon, um, I wanted to end the podcast um, talking about uh, something that I think is really important for the time, and that is allyship. And so in my uh, experience, allyship is the um, support and championing of underrepresented folks um, in academic spaces um, by people that have more assumed privilege. And so um, I, I'd appreciate your candid thoughts about uh, a, a couple of things. And so uh, in your experience, um, well, what is an ally and what are the characteristics of an effective ally for people from underrepresented groups? So first of all, you just have to be real. Know, understand your own privilege and leverage it. I heard a wonderful talk once about the responsibility of privilege and that we may not feel privileged in every circumstance, but when we walk into different parts of our lives, we carry privilege with us. We carry power with us, right? You have a PhD. You, have, you are carrying that privilege of knowledge and education with you, right? but you may walk into another room where you are less privileged by virtue of the makeup of that room, right? And so where we own it, where we have it, we should use it. And so I think all of us have an obligation, all of us to be an ally in the scenarios where we are in the room with privilege and with power. Um, so part of that is just the self-awareness to know where you have it and how you can use it. Um, not to be overbearing with it. Sometimes I'm almost too, um, uh, I admit I've been caught with being like <laughs> too eager to help and not everybody's looking for allyship at that moment. So also having the grace to offer it and then to back off if somebody doesn't want it, right? And that's something I've had to learn because I, I instantly see somebody I, can, I think I can help and I wanna jump right in and they might not be where, where you are in that. So, uh, communication, offering your allyship, offering your guidance, but it's not guidance in like a, a patronizing way, but just, you know, offering yourself as an ally, um, but not necessarily acting on it until you have their acceptance of it is important. Um, I also, um, I, I think that I, I believe a, a really good ally will also look to see where somebody may not have allyship. So one of the things that I've done is I've, I mean, I'll be honest, Sonny, you're a great example. I wasn't sure I was projecting. I was projecting 
that you probably weren't getting the kind of mentorship you needed. So I jumped in and sort of took it on because I could see talent and, and I didn't want that talent lost or wasted or missed, right? Uh, of course, I admit now, I don't think I asked. <laughs> I'm getting more mature about this. I asked now when I offer allyship, but um, I think that there are so many people that don't have even opportunities to engage with mentors or allies. And so when I see the chance to jump in, I do. So I would give an exam some examples of how we can do it. Asking people to give a seminar, asking somebody to co-organize a symposium with you, because that elevates that person's name and their work. Citing people, cite good people's work. When you give a presentation, call people out by name. I mean, those are little things, but those collectively compound and give somebody a reputation that they wouldn't have if other people weren't calling them out. Also, that's to elevate people, but also protecting, again, not trying to sound patronizing, but a good ally will step in when somebody's being talked over or when somebody's idea is credited incorrectly. That doesn't take much. It's not much political capital. It's just about being a good, a good citizen, right? So I think allyship changes as a function of your role, the moment, who's with you. Um, but I, I personally think there's a moral obligation to offer yourself when you have that opportunity to be an ally and elevate somebody. It's, it's, it's mind boggling that why you wouldn't. Thank you. And we'll move right along. And this is a content warning. We will talk about um, some sticky issues here. Um, my follow-up question is, do you find that your allyship practices are different for Black scholars than for other people of color? Because as we know, um, anti-Blackness is different than just your run-of-the-real, run-of-the-mill racism. So I actually don't find it more difficult to, to be an advocate for, for my Black friends and colleagues. Um, I actually find it more of an imperative because in the situations that come to my mind immediately, really tangible situations, but I'm not gonna put people's names out here uh, because of the sensitivity of some of their experiences. Um, I have witnessed um, such poor behavior towards people, such being overlooked, being undervalued, and so, um, I feel there's even, you know, I talked before about a moral imperative, like I have found that because my black friends have been so outnumbered in academe, like I, I go to bat fast. Um, so I, do I find it harder? No. Do I find it more necessary? Absolutely. Um, when I was earlier on in my career, I found it a little bit harder just because I wasn't sure how to be a good advocate, how to use my situation. But I shared with you just a moment ago ways you can help people, right? So I have one wonderful colleague that I just saw that nobody was stepping forward to engage him. I mean, they're friendly and citing his papers, but I started asking him to help co-organizing conferences with me. And let's, let's because I, that's something I could control, right? So I think a lot of it is about being intentional uh, in what you can control. Now I can do a lot more and I'm very outspoken. <laughs> um, and have been actively, I'm on an advisory board for our campus's anti-racism task force, which is specifically looking at systemic racism in, in our institution for our black faculty, staff, and students. And I'm on the advisory board for that, and I'm really very involved and vocal. Um, so do I find it hard? No. Do I find it necessary? Absolutely. I think what I find a little bit is um, it's just so frustrating that I can't get more people aboard sometimes. So one of the things I had to do is I had my um, my leadership team start following hashtag Black in the Academy or a Black in STEM or Black Tax. Like there's so many of them, right? Um, those very explicit ones, right? Because because there's it is a challenge to be underrepresented in academia, and it's a challenge to be a woman in STEM. It's a it's a challenge to be an you know an, an Asian person in STEM. It's a challenge to be LGBTQ plus uh, in 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 the fields as well. But the, the disparity for our, our Black colleagues is just so acute. Um, I, made, I made them do that. And so that's the kind of ways I can be an advocate now. Um, and it's, it's, it's just good work, it has lots to do. Um, and I'm, I'm actually, this is gonna sound a little weird perhaps, but I'm grateful to the opportunity that the recent national conversation has given us because this isn't a new issue, right? It's not like we've all of a sudden discovered racism 
right? We've been living it. People have lived it and borne the burden for so long, but it's brought it out into the open. So I, I really actually feel more empowered to be an advocate and an ally now than I could be even a year and a half ago before Floyd's murder. Exactly. And um, that brings me to my next question. Now that we have permission and we are able to more clearly talk about this, why do you think some people or some people with privilege are still uncomfortable or are uncomfortable? So I think there's just so many people that, um, I mean, they're just clueless. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but if your entire life has been in a homogeneous silo, and you've been so, especially in academia, where we've, we've over-selected for people who are focused narrowly, they haven't spent any time thinking beyond their world. And so um, I don't think there's some in, there's intentionality in, in, in this cluelessness. I literally think it's just life experience. So we have an obligation to educate, right? I mean, I, I mean, you can, now I understand like heard somebody once speak, like you can have book clubs all you want, you can read, but that doesn't change things. But it's, it is fundamentally important to start it because there are people that until recently just did not know what these disparities were. So, um, you know, uh, and then when you, when, when you start learning them, it's sort of like when I ask people to start reading uh, the black tax hashtag, right? I had one of my department heads comment about how upsetting that was. Like not upsetting that he was not valuing it, but it's just like the rawness, the realness of it. He, he was embarrassed how oblivious he was. So I think there's a reason to be uncomfortable uh, because it's causing you to sort of just revisit your whole value system, your whole understanding of how you've thought about life, life experience, how you've thought about your own experience. Like, and then you're like, oh my God, look at all this privilege that my life is based on, right? And it makes people hugely uncomfortable. And honestly, we work hard not to be uncomfortable. It's a human nature is to try to, to avoid the uncomfortable. And so giving people the skills to talk it through, giving people the venues, the safe spaces to talk it through is really, really, really important. In our college, I'm, I'm mandating some trainings along these lines for all faculty staff. Um, and some people are really uncomfortable, but you know, I've seen some people you thought would be the last to come to the party, so to speak, show up, be vocal, be supportive, and, and embrace that moment. And, um, and really, I mean, we have culture change that's going to take years. I'm not saying we're there by any means. But when, when people you never thought would be comfortable having these tough conversations or having them and advocating for them, you know you're making progress. So I, I think we're going to, I'm optimistic we're going to do this. But one of the other pieces, and I'll be quiet, is just I think we need to train everybody in civil discourse, right? We tend to have only paid attention to those in the arts and humanities to give them all these extra classes to have these difficult sort of critical conversations and writings. In engineering, we, we've sort of avoided that. Like, let's give them the skills to communicate technically. We've not developed, we've like underdeveloped the muscle in terms of communication and understanding around the, those soft things. And I say soft, not that they're any less important than um, but rather, we haven't equipped people in STEM with the, with the tools like we have to people often in humanities and, and social sciences. And so we need to do that. So that's on us to better educate the next generation of engineers and scientists so that we don't end up with a generation of faculty who are afraid to talk about these difficult things. She said what she said. And... Thank you for this candid conversation. And last, I'll ask you, some people think that academia is a zero sum game. Do you truly believe that there is room for all of us to have resources and make a difference in academia? I do. I really, I really do. I, I hope that, um, well, I can, uh, let me just back up and say, I can't control academia, but I control the space I manage. And at least within my college, there's room for everybody. And over time, I'm looking to the future of higher ed, promoting more administrators and senior leaders that understand what it takes to make academia accessible in a place where people can all be successful. So I'm optimistic we're going to see more change. In the meantime, I don't want to uh, minimize the difficulty so many have had and so many have experienced. Um, I just hope that you'll stick with us long enough. Don't leave the academy 
uh, yet. Give it a try, look for the mentors, look for the allies and look for the institutions that will support you. As I said, you are movable. You don't realize it, but you are not stuck anywhere. And although moving institutions is painful, I've done it, Sonny's just sort of living it right now uh, for various reasons that we've chosen to do that, but you're not trapped. Um, keep, keep working towards you until you find that environment where you can thrive, you deserve it. Um, and I will work with anybody I can to try to make it a accepting and supportive environment. Um, to all of those of you who are from historically underrepresented groups, I want you to know from my heart, your ideas matter, your presence matters, your ideas matter, your, your place in academia matters, Black Lives Matter, it all matters. And I just, I just hope that you will, will uh, fight the good fight, work towards equilibrium, uh, and, and stick it out because the next generation needs us. We are laying the groundwork for change and that change may not come at the speed we want, but that groundwork, we build a good foundation. It could be, it could be changing for generations. So please, please stay in the game. And with that, Sharon, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you said, your time spent today, and for the words that you said today that will resonate with so many of us. Thank you so much. And this has been episode four of Under the Hood, and we'll talk to you next time.